Thank you so much, Richard. It's an absolute honour to be here, uh, part of this wonderful international meeting. Uh, I feel extremely privileged um, to be the resident artist today. So, uh, and I'm going to talk to you about how um, art can, I hope, help you all and be a really good tool to engage people with your work and your local shorebirds and shorebird habitat. So today I want to ex discuss um, the challenge that you face or that we face of engaging people with shorebirds and their habitat and the challenges that shorebirds face, how art can help address these challenges and also whether shorebird related art can actively help um, shorebird conservation. So I'm from Melbourne, as Richard said, which you can see pointed out here on the map. Uh, we're very, very lucky in Melbourne. We've got at least three beautiful Ramsar wetlands within about 100k of Melbourne, which make, makes it a great place to be, to be able to introduce people to migratory shorebirds and their habitat because we can um, organise site visits without, um, you know, within a day trip. Um, this is my press in my studio, which I haven't been able to go to um, for some months, but I'm showing you this too because a lot of the projects I'm going to talk about are print based uh, because I'm a printmaker, obviously, and that's my press where I make my prints. Um, the printmaking community is a very close knit community, not unlike the birding community. Uh, we gather together to share equipment. A lot of the equipment we use to make prints is very specialised and big and expensive, so we have a lot of print workshops. We also gather together to share techniques and ideas. Um, some of you will be, I think, very familiar with printmaking techniques, which include etching, silkscreen prints, woodcuts, wood engravings, lino cutting, lithography, just to name a few. Um, and my mediums are uh, mainly these days I do liner cuts, the two bottom images are liner cuts and etching top left and mono printing. So that's just a bit of a, a background of where I come from. So the problem that we all face is that migratory shorebirds still face a multitude of threats. This has become particularly apparent through the course of our, our workshop today. Um, but they don't do themselves any favours. Migratory shorebirds are hard to see and even harder to identify and their habitat is quite often not beautiful. So when we're talking about visiting and preserving this habitat, um, it's often not what people think of as being valuable habitat. It's often thought of as being empty and just waiting to be used. Um, So the challenge is that for over 40 years, uh, Australian shorebird groups have been enlisting thousands of citizen scientists to help monitor populations. And yet despite this engagement with this huge number of, of volunteers, shorebirds are still very, very poorly known and understood uh, when we talk about the general population and you can't save what you don't know. So the task ahead then is to educate, connect and act. Now we're trying to take people from zero, not even ever herding, um, having heard of a shorebird, knowing what a shorebird is, to acting. Um, a lot of the problems shorebirds face are quite urgent. So we want to stir up this passion um, as quickly as possible and in the best way possible uh, because we're taking people from we want to tell them about it but we don't want people just to know about the birds we actually want them to care about the birds and care enough to volunteer to help to sign a petition donate money join an organization even change their vote uh, or walk their dog a different way all these things are tricky so how can we do this? Well, obviously, through art. Um, no, art's not the only way to do this, but art is definitely a very powerful tool that I think can be more enlisted or enlisted more broadly to help you all in um, your pursuit to engage the, the broader public. 
and this is super Godric, obviously. Um, so why art? Well, uh, I'm speaking mainly of the visual arts. So visual arts, it's all in the name. Art makes things visible. And shorebirds are not visible. That's one of their problems. But then once upon a time, nobody knew anything about whales. And then all of a sudden, everybody in the world cares about whales. And shorebirds are actually a lot easier to see than whales. So it's not impossible. Um, art can boldly go where science is constrained. And I'm just going to read a quote now from an, um, a book called Art and Eco Ecology, which puts it all quite well. Whether artists are taking part in an existing research project as an active member or invited guest, or have devised the study themselves, they provide a critical complement to more established approaches to scientific investigation, focusing on an aspect that serious mainstream science might consider insignificant, or bringing an alternative social or ethical view, or just a broader cultural perspective to bear on the inquiry. Without the responsibility of needing to find answers, the artist can fulfil a vital role by simply looking at a problem from an innovative angle or by posing a difficult or unexpected question that might otherwise go unasked. And unlike the scientist who may be led by institutional or commercial imperatives, not to mention the rigorous, the rigorous assessment of peers, the artist can apply his or her own criteria of success to a study, prioritising such things as creativity, wonder and beauty, and thereby opening up areas of research to entirely new approaches and discoveries. Moreover, art's ability to communicate in imaginative ways brings with it the potential of engaging the public's interest in issues that otherwise might not enter the general consciousness. So today I'm going to talk about um, my projects, um, which I've been lucky enough to, to be involved in, or to start, to initiate, and make happen, um, uh, for your interest and to see sort of different takes uh, that have worked with, with artists. Um, and so I've been working in my, with my own work since about 2010 on migratory shorebirds and um, I've initiated three group projects and then there's another uh, project in schools that I've been involved in. Oh, also this year, because of the constraints of COVID-19 and the galleries being shut, um, I've done a collaboration with Simone Slattery and Anthony Albrecht who are wonderful, talented and clever musicians of the Bowerbird Collective and um, we'll put a link in the chat to that because that's a musical meditation uh, inviting you to actually become a bar-tailed godwit that you can do anywhere you are in the world. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is the Flyway Print Exchange. Um, this is the only project I've done with artists that actually live uh, don't all live in Australia. It involves 20 artists from nine of the flyaway countries. And this project has been exhibited more than 20 times since um, it was initiated in 2014, uh, including in Hong Kong, Indonesia and Singapore. Oh, those are the 20 prints. So 20 artists, so that's a mosaic of the 20 prints that were part of the project. Um, the nine countries that the artists come from are um, Australia, New Zealand, Indonesia, Singapore, India, the Republic of Korea, Japan, China, and the USA, specifically Alaska in the USA. And this print is an etching by one of the three Chinese artists involved in the project, uh, Feng Jian Ming, and he's from, and I apologize for my pronunciation, Guangzhou in Wangdong province. And this is a technical side note. Um, one of the reasons that prints are so good for projects like this is because uh, the nature of um, the printmaking process means that it's a reproducible art form. Uh, this means that you tend to create your image on a substrate, whether it's wood or metal or um, lino, and then you print that image onto your paper. This means that you can print as many prints as you want of the same image. Um, but it's all, each one is an original print still, an original artwork. Uh, and so these are three of my artists, my lovely artists, um, signing their prints. 
Um, the two on the right are the other two artists from China. At the top, Nijian Ming, who had an unfortunate accident and he's signing, he's in hospital, but he was okay. And below, Xiao Hua, who's signing his. And then on the left um, is Pui San um, from Singapore. And he's actually, uh, he shows people around the Sungai Bulo wetlands in Singapore. And he's been to visit us here in Australia. But a lot of the other artists I've never met still to this day. So they're, um, it's a testament to their generosity that they were part of the project at all. Um, so they each made 30 prints. So that's an addition of 30. Uh, 20 was to exchange. That was the artist's payment. Uh, each artist got a set of all of the 20 prints. Uh, we had six to sell um, to raise money uh, for um, that was all donated to BirdLife Australia. And four sets were kept as exhibition sets. Um, and one of each print from those four exhibition sets was actually posted along the flyway. I posted it to New Zealand. It went from the New Zealand artist to Puisan in Singapore, then up to Gary Collitz, who was in um, Alaska, and then back to me. So the idea was, so they weren't covered or put in an envelope. It was just the print that was folded up and addressed and stamped. So if you go to an exhibition of the Flyway Print Exchange, you'll see the pristine print, like the one on the left, and that's framed. But you'll also see the set of the, the partner print, the travelled print. And the idea of that is that those prints have literally done the journey that the birds have done. So you can't invite a shorebird into the gallery to talk about their trip, obviously. But the travelled prints, the idea of them is to, that they can tell the story of the birds, um, that they wear, have the wear and tear of the birds' plumage and they bear all the signs of, of distance, although I must say that being taken through the postal system is probably a lot less challenging than flying. Um, and this print is by Ed McHell, who was the second artist from Alaska, uh, and his mother is Inupiat um, from Point Hope, which is just um, around the coast of Alaska. It's one of the uh, western points sticking out. Um, so it was lovely to have Ed involved uh, in that project. Um, the next project is called From a Home to a Home, A Story of Migration. And this was inspired uh, by using migratory shorebirds as a metaphor for human migration. And so it's a multi, it was a multidisciplinary exhibition. Um, artists didn't have to be printmakers. They could use whatever medium they chose. Uh, it introduced the, all the artists who were involved to the idea of migratory shorebirds for the first time. Um, and they were invited to take shorebirds as a starting point for their work. They made work specifically for the exhibition, but it was just the beginning idea, the seed idea was the migratory shorebirds. Um, so I'm going to, just going to show you a, a few works to give you an idea of the scope from that exhibition. The first one is by Min Fan, um, a Vietnamese artist. And his work was actually a video. Uh, and I'll just read what he wrote. Um, I was particularly drawn to the poetry of shorebirds as a metaphor for the exploration of migration. This resonated with my own interest in diaspora and identity, having come to Australia as a seven-year-old Vietnamese boat person. This is a photo of an embroidered phoenix on a traditional Vietnamese dress that my mother brought with her. I've shown the reverse side of the embroidery to show the stitchwork and labour behind the image. Its imperfection evokes a weary, embattled, feathery look that echoes the plight of our shorebirds, but also the struggles of migration, human or birds, counterpointed by the hope intrinsic to the metaphor of the rising phoenix. My video is inspired both by the embroidered phoenix on my mother's traditional Vietnamese long dress and by my uncle's escape from Vietnam via aeroplane and his uncle's name was Phong, which means Phoenix. And um, the video, you can see a still from the video on the left, was he, he had a, um, a paper plane and he burnt it, but the video was played in, in reverse so that you end up with the, the paper plane sitting there as a kind of a symbol of, of hope and resilience. And um, Min was really happy because he said he'd never 
done a work about his uncle because most people think of um, people who fled uh, Vietnam as going by boat, but his uncle actually left by plane. So it all played into the story of the shorebirds migration quite beautifully. Um, next, uh, there's the work by Emma Shin, who's a, a lovely artist also from Melbourne. Um, now she's migrated to Melbourne. But her family heritage consists of both native Japanese and Koreans who immigrated to Japan in the 1920s and 30s. And Emma compared the physiological changes wrought in the body of a migrating shorebird to the changes in a woman's body during pregnancy. So that's what her work was about. Uh, my piece was called The Birds Fly Past the Window and it was an installation. And um, I'm not a migrant myself, but my parents immigrated to Australia from Britain in 1966. And it's partly their story as migrants that began my interest in the shorebird metaphor. Because I know from talking particularly to my mother that um, her heart is always split between her home in England, where she left and where her family were, and um, her home in Australia, of course, you know, she'd had her children. Um, and I felt that shorebirds capture that longing perfectly because they are always annually compelled to travel from one side of the world to the other, from a home to a home. And so in my work, I research traditional shapes of windows uh, from different flyaway countries and I tried to reproduce them roughly life size in lino cuts and printed them on this fabric. And I also had Bartel Godwit shapes, Bartel Godwit's my favourite, um, cut out of um, mirrored perspex and they were, the shapes were stuck around the walls of the room um, uh, to mimic a, a flock in flight, uh, which had the effect of it, it caught the light, but it also meant that as people entered the room and walked through the room, they were reflected in the Godwit. So essentially they became a part of that flock as well. Uh, and the idea is that it could be of solace to the migrant to think that you see a bird leave the shore here and somebody you've left behind might look out of their window and see that very same bird fly past. So it's the linking of cultures and individuals by the flyway and by these birds that um, that work was about. Um, and last year I was really, really lucky to be invited to be artist in residence at Point Cook College. Point Cook is a suburb in the west of Melbourne, very, very close to the Western Treatment Plant, which uh, many of you will know is very famous uh, shorebird habitat. So we had a beautiful group of 17 kids aged seven to 12, it was primary. Um, and we took them to the Western Treatment Plant to see the shorebirds with the wonderful Lyndall Kidd from um, BirdLife Australia, who can explain, uh, who really is wonderful at sharing the shorebird story also. Uh, and it's really important, of course, to get children involved whenever you can, because not only do they, does their passion infect, you know, their family, their friends, but hopefully then they'll also grow up with the desire to, um, uh, you know, preserve shorebirds and shorebird habitat and the environment in general. Um, so as you can see, I helped them do lino cuts of, of shorebirds and do backgrounds. And we wrote this beautiful story about Rosie the Bartel Godwit. And there you can see Rosie stopping off at the Yellow Sea, which is yellow, as is the Yellow Sea. And she's getting very fat. She's very happy there because she's found a very, very long polychaete worm to slurp down. Um, and then the kids actually performed the story to the, um, to the school. So that was just beautiful uh, and very exciting to be a part of. So um, the Overwintering Project is the ongoing project that I launched in 2017. And I think it's probably go on, going to go on until I die, really, um, because it's so exciting and more and more people are just getting involved, which is wonderful. Um, Around 250 artists have so far contributed prints. It's, this is another, we're going back to print now. It's a print based, uh, primarily a print based project. Um, around 250 artists have contributed over 300 prints to, um, to the project, but also artists have made more work for local exhibitions and the numbers are still growing. Um, I just want to point out at this point that art exhibitions 
are a real opportunity for scientists because most exhibitions now have a what's called a public program which is another way of getting people into the gallery um, so if you're working with artists who have an exhibition you can give talks in the gallery or presentations or demonstrations you can show potentially show films or videos you could have panel discussions you could do shorebird id workshops or guided site visits from the gallery into the local habitat um, a gallery can give a focal point. Um, it's a much more neutral space if you wanted to even bring in stakeholders who are trying to do things um, to, you know, to damage or reclaim wetland. It's, it's a neutral space in which to have discussions about things like that. Um, and also exhibitions can focus on the local habitat near the gallery or even on specific um, species. So the project structure is um, for the overwintering project. Uh, the main thing, I mean, what I'm doing is I'm inviting artists to go to find out where their local migratory shorebird habitat is, to go into the site. Now, this is absolutely critical, preferably with a shorebird expert who can explain why that site is important and also show them where the shorebirds are. Um, and then um, I'm asking them to make a print based on that habitat, but on any aspect of it, not necessarily the birds, although I must admit most people do do the birds because once people discover migratory shorebirds, they're pretty blown away and excited about them. Um, but they don't have to because it's about the habitat. You can't save the birds if you don't save the habitat. Uh, and there are core exhibitions, which are the ones that I'm in charge of, which exhibit the overwintering project print portfolio but there are also local exhibitions which can be initiated by anybody anywhere around Australia or New Zealand. There have been two in New Zealand. Um, so there have been 19 local exhibitions so far, including the two in New Zealand. There's been seven core exhibitions around Australia with three more in the pipeline. Um, and as I said, uh, at the moment, the portfolio contains over 300 prints, but it's open each time there's another exhibition. I have another deadline for prints and more people come in. So the idea is to build this community that's part of something, a project that has its own momentum. Um, and so far we've raised from the sale of prints. So 100% each print costs $200. 100% of that is donated to BirdLife Australia. Um, so far we've raised $23,000 and that's gone towards tracking the beautiful oriental pratt and coal um, and i must here stop and give a great big thank you to the scientific community because none of this would be possible without you without you going out and doing those hours of work and allowing um, us to disseminate that knowledge and getting excited about it um, so that's that's wonderful and we it's a great partnership um, and what I've found is that the artists are really, really keen to join and also to stay involved. They really enjoy making art with a purpose. Um, and people are really, really hungry to find ways to help the environment through something and to give them a tool, a way to do that through an avenue that they already have skills in and love. Um, yeah, has, has been a really great thing. It's worked really well. So the site visits, as I said, are really, really critical because that's building that relationship and that caring between people and, um, and the, the habitat. Um, here we are being taken out by the amazing Maureen Christie um, in South Australia and we had artists. Uh, so Maureen's on the border between Victoria in the east and South Australia in the west so we had artists from both sides of the border come and do shorebird trips with Maureen there um, and I think I was talking about the shorebird habitat um, shorebirds utilize land we often disregard because we've already despoiled it with sewage or salt works or industry but the gift of the shorebirds presence renders the land precious and reminds us that even areas like that link us directly into this wonderful global environment. Um, and I'd also like to thank um, Ken Gosbell's taken us out, Danny Rogers, Rog Standen, Tony Flaherty, lots of people have given their time, their knowledge 
very generously were out here in Flinders with Penny looking at her ruddy turnstones. Um, so if the flyway print exchange was about the idea of the flyway and from a home to a home was about migration, the overwintering project is about our idea of home. And um, I don't know if you know, but the word ecology comes from the Greek word oikos, which actually means home. So it's all very much linked. So I thought I'd just show you a few of the prints to give you an idea of the scope. Um, if you want to see more, they are all on the website and also with the artist's scientific um, artistic statement. So every artist has written something about their print and some of them have even been moved to write a poem or draw several maps or do all sorts of things. Um, some of the prints like this beautiful Eastern Curlew by Annie Day uh, are quite sort of scientifically accurate. Um, but others, not so much, you know, it's whatever people have, have, you know, whatever way people have chosen to portray the birds is absolutely fine because you just don't know what's going to make somebody stop and look at the image and suddenly go, you know, I love that, I want to know more about it. Um, uh, Anne Miles has done a, a rock pool. She was on that trip with Maureen. So that's more about the habitat. And Elaine's done a beautiful dragonfly because I said to the artist, well, because it's about um, the shorebirds, of course, but the habitat, um, it's important to, you know, to learn about the habitat, but also the other creatures that are supported by that habitat, you know, in the network and the ecology of that place. Um, and this by Monica Oppen is about Botany Bay that Phil Straw was talking about yesterday and about how the um, how Sydney Airport has affected the habitat of the shorebirds there. And then Karen's is, is from um, a trip to the Western Treatment Plant um, and it's showing the feathers that are caught in the, the growth there. Now, um, we've been very lucky, again, talking about involving children. Uh, one of my artists worked for Ansto uh, uh, she was part of an exhibition, a local exhibition in Hazelhurst near Botany Bay again. Um, and it, for the exhibition that she was involved in there, that they initiated, uh, Ansto supported the running of a, um, a drawing competition, a shorebird drawing competition for primary school children. Now that was so successful, um, they got 26 local schools involved that uh, Ansto uh, agreed to roll out the shorebird drawing competition, which they then extended into an act, actually a, a shorebird uh, poster competition for primary age children um, in conjunction with the overwintering project indefinitely. And last year, no, this year, uh, for the first time, it was Australia wide. So that's very exciting and that's ongoing. Um, and also we have the flock. Uh, now this isn't specific to the overwintering project. It was initiated by the Miranda Shorebird Centre in New Zealand. Um, and it's been used all around Australia in conjunction with um, celebrations and uh, of wetlands and, and shorebirds all over the place. So it's just we are also using that lovely tool. It's a, a community art project and you get um, the shorebird silhouette templates cut out in wood uh, and then you invite people to come and paint it and it's a lovely thing because people of any age can be involved um, and then it makes this wonderful display that you know brings other people in to see what it's all about um, so that's been a really lovely part of it as well um, so does it work can art affect change um, now, because I was talking to scientists, I did this excellent, excellent diagram. Um, this is like, this is my spheres of influence diagram. So you've got the shorebirds, obviously, and they're not, they're not talking to us. So we need the scientists to work out what the shorebirds are doing, where they're going, why they're so special, so very special. And then the artists are taking that amazing information that you've uncovered and they're making their works about that in whatever way moves them. 
and then those work so and the artists of course will be they work on it for a while and they'll research it in their own time and they'll share that information with other artists uh with their families um and with their colleagues so that's being disseminated already and then once it's in a gallery and in a public space then that knowledge is is disseminated to the general public and so that's sort of the circles of engagement and how we're hoping that knowledge and passion will be disseminated gradually out to the public um, by this partnership between artists and scientists. Um, now, images can influence our behaviour. I'm just bringing this up as an example. Um, this is a very, very famous photograph and it'll be known by a lot of the Australians in the audience. Uh, it's called Morning Mist Rock Island Bend Franklin River by photographer Peter Dombrovskis. And um, in the 1980s, in 1983, there was a political situation where um, the party that was in power was going to dam the Franklin River, which is a big wild river in um, the wilderness in um, Tasmania for a hydroelectric scheme and the other party um, promised that if they got into power they would not damn the Franklin. Um, so they ran this image as a full page ad in major Australian newspapers in the lead up to the 1983 federal election with the caption could you vote for a party that would destroy this and this image and it is a photograph, it's, it's not a, a, an artwork in another way, but it's definitely an artwork, is credited with turning the tide for that election. election. So now the Franklin River continues to run free. Uh, in addition, there are studies that have found that being directly engaged in environmental art projects um, and visiting exhibitions can have a lasting influence on awareness and behaviour. And I can give you those references um, if you're interested. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to do any kind of statistical study uh, regarding the overwintering project, but fundraising is a clear indicator, um, well it, it's a quantifiable benefit I guess you'd say. Um, I don't think it's the major reason to have these exhibitions, but it certainly is a very, um, it's a wonderful um, byproduct of having the exhibitions and selling the prints. Um, and as I've said, uh, we've been able to um, donate uh, all the money raised so far to, um, uh, to the Australasian Way to Studies group. And we'll continue to, to raise money as long as the project continues to go. Um, and some printmakers, I've only asked them to donate. You see, they're not, they're not getting paid. They're just donating their works. Um, and, and I've only asked them to donate two, but some artists have started donating uh, more than two, so there's more more to sell, uh, which is wonderful. So fundraising is a clear and concrete outcome. Um, and also I hope that by no donating all the funds to concrete projects, so rather than, you know, saying, well, it's going into administration or, or whatever, if you can uh, donate it like we have to the Oriental Pratt & Coles, the idea is also that it'll instill a sense of ownership in the participating artists for the shorebird project as well. What I do have though is some testimonials from artists who've been involved in the overwintering project which I thought I'd share with you. This is just a, a small selection. Um, so Amanda Watts, she's writing that she, um, yeah, being involved in the project has made her much more aware of migratory shorebirds and she's sharing that knowledge with her friends and family. Um, Paul O'Brien, um, He's calling himself an advocate for protection of habitats locally within the Newcastle area. And he's also sharing that knowledge and that passion with other friends, trying to make them um, give a voice uh, to migratory shorebirds. Um, Penny Wilson, um, her testimonial is quite long, but she's very taken with the birds. Um, the passion, you know, she says she surprises people with figures about the birds, shrinking their organs, um, 
so she's she's also sharing the shorebird love i think you can clearly say uh telling people spreading the message and um lastly sally north um she's joined birdlife capricornia she's doing another collaboration on shorebirds uh, and she's bought a telephoto lens her husband has got binoculars so i think a lot of goodwill has been instilled in the artists who've joined the project um, and there's also we also we stay in touch so it's creating a, a creative community of caring individuals because we stay in touch through a newsletter that I send out and um, there's social media uh, there's Facebook pages um, and uh, some artists have sent me a print every year over the past three years uh, and um, some print workshops for instance uh, Migaloo printmakers in Queensland are currently holding their third uh, exhibition related to the overwintering project called Wetlanders and that's uh, up in uh, in Brisbane just near Moreton Bay near Toondah Harbour where uh, the Walker Corporation is trying to do a huge development uh, right on top of um, Eastern Curlew habitat so um, so that's you know partly of course why why they're doing that there and they're doing wonderful work and they're very passionate um, so, in conclusion, um, you are the knowledge holders and I think that artists can help amplify and spread your message and I think you shouldn't forget that it is a very, very great gift that you are giving the world with this knowledge that you've discovered um, and I think that scientists and artists, it can be a beautiful and lasting partnership and thank you. That's the end of my talk.